Good morning. It is a real delight to be with you on this Sunday morning as we share time together on this virtual platform. The message comes from Trinity Presbyterian Church in Linwood in Pretoria, and you are enormously welcome to be with us as we share this message. I would like to read um, to you as a call to worship a short passage from the message written by Eugene Peterson and I'm reading in chapter 11. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you this morning as your sons and your daughters. We delight in the fact that we can gather on this virtual platform to share prayers to hear your word from the scriptures and to share thoughts on the passage that we will be looking at this morning, Psalm 25. Guide us that we may not only hear the message, but that we may understand it in a new light, that we may take it in and reflect your word in the way we live our lives on a daily basis in a way that brings glory to you. Jesus, we ask all of these things in your precious and wonderful name. Amen. Our faith journey is like a pilgrimage. It was, I think, in 2007 when I first read about the ancient pilgrim route from Europe through Spain to the northwestern corner of Spain and to the city of Santiago. I know that Sue, my wife, thought I was a little crazy when I said that we should walk across northern Spain. But subsequently, we have done so on a few occasions. Our longest outing took us from inside France, across the Pyrenees, across northern Spain, through medieval villages, along paths that had been trodden on by hundreds of thousands of pilgrims who'd walked that path before us all the way to Santiago. That was about 1,000 kilometers. This ancient route has been walked since the 10th century, and we found that there were lessons from this physical, mental, and spiritual journey. For a start, you need to slow down. Someone said that this is to experience life at four kilometers an hour. And you have with you only that which you can carry in your rucksack on your back. In the words of the writer of Hebrews, you need to throw off everything that hinders. And if you carry too much, it means you will either get injured or you just will not complete the journey. You see many people shedding clothing and equipment over the first few days of this pilgrimage. And we experienced that walking this pilgrimage in a way was very similar to our journey through life and also our journey of faith. Perhaps five points that I want you to think about this morning. You need to be intentional about starting. You need markers, signposts that will guide you along the way. You need to be shown the way. Thirdly, you need to be prepared for ups and downs. You need help along the way and you need perseverance. And author Steve Farrer wrote this. When you walk into a, a cemetery, you look at the headstones and see someone's name, date of birth and date of death. But what do you see between the two dates? You see a short horizontal line, a hyphen. 
and the hyphen represents the whole life of that person's stay here on earth, whether short or long, happy or tragic, glorious or shameful. You and I tend to look at the two dates. We see the beginning and we see the end. But the real story, says the author, is in the hyphen. The hyphen represents the trail of someone's life. Each one of us is somewhere along that trail of life. And it's good to take stock now and then. And it's good to take stock and to know that we are not alone. From Joshua, don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And it's good to know that the trail that we are to follow, the path that we are to follow, has been marked out for us by those who have gone before us, and that we can ask the way. David knew this from his Psalms. You have made known to me the path of life. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside quiet waters. He guides me in paths of righteousness. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. You need to be intentional, our first point. The decision to walk the Camino de Santiago was intentional. Of course, I first had to persuade Sue that this was something we needed to do, but she quickly agreed. And having done that, we needed to be intentional to take the necessary steps to place ourselves in a position where we could start the journey. And it's the same uh, in regard to our journey of faith. Jesus called out, follow me, to those who became his disciples, and it was their decision to do so. It was intentional. Joshua knew this. He challenged his followers to choose that day whether they would follow the Lord and throw away all other gods. And then he told his followers that, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Intentional. If you are already a Christ follower, you became one when you made that choice. Paul wrote this, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you feel called this morning to become a follower of Christ, then you need to make that confession and accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. You can do that right now. Joshua's challenge to his followers was, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. As we journey along, we need markers and we need to be shown the way. The pilgrim route to Santiago is marked uh, by signposts with yellow arrows and yellow scallop shells. And the scallop shell signified the fact that a pilgrim had reached Santiago, gone on to the Atlantic Ocean and had returned home with a scallop shell, signifying the completion of the pilgrimage. And those markers are supplemented these days by good guidebooks or an electronic app. app. A book was prepared known as the Codex Calixtinus, written in the 12th century, and that would have served as a guidebook for early pilgrims, for those who had access to that book. It contained a description of the route, uh, works of art to be seen along the way, and the customs of the local people. An important thing it is to have a guidebook to not only show you the way, but to give you some of the history, the background and the happenings that had taken place along the route. But I can assure you that even with a good guidebook, 
it's quite easy to lose your way. And on a number of occasions, we were helped by locals who knew the way, who knew that we were walking to Santiago and who would call out to stop us and say, you're on the wrong path. Don't go that way. Turn around and go along this road. We were always extremely grateful for this because walking many, many kilometers um, is tiring and you certainly don't want to find yourself on the wrong, wrong road or walking many extra kilometers. In reading Psalm 25 that we will consider this morning, I was reminded that the scriptures contain markers that guide us on our journey of faith and that we are able to ask to be shown the way. There are others who are walking with us who can guide us and we need to encourage and guide others who walk alongside us as well. David knew this and this is reflected in more than 70 psalms that he wrote. In Psalm 25 we read in verse 4, Show me your ways, Lord, teach me your paths. David is asking that he be guided to make sure that he is on the path that God wants him to be on. And this is in fact a prayer for guidance and pardon. The third thing is we need to be prepared for ups and downs. David was intentional, he was fully committed to God, and this is reflected in this psalm and in the others that were written by him. At the same time, he knew how easy it was to take the wrong road, and he had done so himself many times. In verse 11 we read, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. He knew that he had stumbled on many occasions, that on many occasions he had chosen the wrong path, but he was able to call out, Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. If we look at Psalm 25, um, we will see just what David wrote about and what he prayed about. This psalm is an acrostic or alphabetic psalm, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, 22 verses, each verse starting with a, a letter of the alphabet, so in a sense in the Hebrew alphabet from A to Z. And this was not only an artistic way of writing poetry, but it was also sometimes said that this was done to show that the writing covered completely the topics that were being dealt with. David certainly had faced many ups and downs in the course of his life. Many of his psalms talk about his being attacked by his enemies, those who were against him. For example, in Psalm 5 we read the following, Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with malice. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they tell lies. David could deal with these ups and downs in his journey of faith because his hope was in God. God was his refuge. And so he starts Psalm 25 like this. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. David repeats the theme of trust and hope in verses 5 and 20 where we read this. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. David knows that as he undertakes the journey of his life and the journey of his faith, that he is never alone. David also knew that he needed help along the way, just as we need help along the way in our journeys 
of faith. In verse 2, David prays for deliverance from his enemies and that he will not be put to shame, that he will be able to act honorably. And this prayer is repeated in verse 25, where he says, Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. David appears to be facing treacherous attacks from enemies without having given them any excuse to do so. In verses 4 and 5, we find where he prays for guidance from God. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. David knows that he needs help along the way. How often do you pause and pray to God that he will show you his way and guide you on the correct path? I know that it's a failing of mine. I very quickly rush into action and make decisions without first pausing and praying for guidance. And too often when I do this, I find that I need to pray, please Lord, help me to get out of the situation in which I now find myself. David is teaching us to pray for guidance before we go into action. He knows how often he has stumbled and how difficult it is to stay on the correct path. He goes on then asking God not to remember the sins of his youth and his rebellious ways, but rather to remember him according to God's great and long-standing mercy and love. Lord, don't remember my sins and my rebellious ways. Lord, remember me in the light of your great, long-standing mercy and love. It's a prayer for forgiveness which is repeated in verses 11 and 18. Forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. Why does David feel that he can come before God in this way? He knows that he can because God is good and God is upright. God instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. This is said out loud in this prayer in this psalm. He guides the humble Humble here describes those who acknowledge that they are without resources and that they cannot meet the challenges of their journey of faith in this life, in their strength alone. David sees himself in that light. He goes on in verses 15 and 16 where he describes his reliance on God and the position in which he finds himself. His eyes are ever on God for only he will release my feet from the snare. His heartfelt prayer is that God turn to him and be gracious to him, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of his heart have increased, and he prays that he will be freed from his anguish. And David is teaching us here in this psalm that not only are we to pray to God to show us the way, but that we are to come humbly to God with our prayers of forgiveness where we have strayed from his path. David says that God makes his covenant known to those that fear the Lord. And the reference to covenant here refers to God's province, uh, promise of his unfailing love for his people, along with his guidelines for living in relationship with him. David goes on praying not only for forgiveness, but he prays that God, God will enable him to live a life that is good and upright, just as God is. David is praying that he will be changed, that he will not continue to stray from God's path, and that God will uphold him. 
David put this into beautiful words in Psalm 51, where we read this. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David wants to be changed, that he does not stumble so often, that he does not stray away from God's path. And he asks in this psalm not only for forgiveness for his own sake, but he says for God's sake as well. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. So David's concern extends beyond just his own personal situation to a concern for God's reputation. He believes that if God refused to forgive him when he asked for forgiveness, this would reflect badly on God, damage the very name and reputation of Israel's God. Walking to Santiago, Sue and I experienced ups and downs in different ways. The first was that there were significant mountains to climb and we gained and lost altitude day after day. Someone suggested to us that it's easy to walk in Spain because Spain is flat. Well, I can tell you, it certainly is not. In addition, very often when you think you've reached the top of a very high climb, you find that you're only on a plateau and that before you rises the next very steep ascent. The second way was the risk of injury, ups and downs in regard to your health. Many people did injure themselves and were either delayed or could not carry on. And in addition, there were days when one of us felt strong and able to go on forever and the other, for some reason, just felt below par. On your journey of faith, you will have ups and downs. In fact, you are to expect them. Jesus warned us of this. But you need to remember that there are markers along the way that will guide you and that you can ask for directions from God and from those brothers and sisters who are walking alongside you. Like God, you can pray to God that he will show you his ways and teach you his paths. You are not alone. And fifthly, one needs perseverance. Eugene Peterson wrote a book with the title, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And it's a book about the Psalms of Ascent, the Psalms that were sung when the pilgrims made their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the different feasts that were celebrated in Jerusalem. And it's a good tit title for walking a pilgrim route. If you want to complete the route, you need to do the same thing over and over again. You get up, you shoulder your rucksack and you begin to walk. There is time to pause. There's time to have a cup of coffee and a meal, to enjoy the beautiful scenery around you. And then you walk on until you reach your destination. And you do this again and again, whether it's in the rain, in sunshine or in snow. A long obedience in the same direction. And our journey of faith is, I believe, the same. We need perseverance, determination, grit, doggedness, tenacity. We need to be on the lookout to make sure that we are on the right road. And this means we need to be intentional about this. Are we following the correct markers? Is it time to stop and ask some on the way? Are we prepared for the ups and downs on the road? Are we ready to share an act of random kindness with a stranger? Are we giving thanks for acts of random kindness shown to us by strangers? The writer of the book of Hebrews wrote that we are to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles so that we can run with perseverance 
the race marked out for us. In doing so, we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who endured the cross for us, was crucified and died so that we would not be eternally separated from God, so that we would be able to complete our journey of faith without growing weary and without losing heart. And the teachings of Jesus stand as markers and guideposts for how we are to live our lives and how we are to respond to what Jesus has already done for us. When Jesus told the disciples that he was going away, but that they knew the way to the place where he was going, Thomas asked, how can we know the way? And Jesus replied, I am the way and the truth and the life. We are all at different stages on our journey of faith in this life. We are not to be discouraged by challenges that will arise and we are to encourage those who journey alongside us. Paul knew this. His journeys took him thousands of kilometers uh, on foot from Jerusalem right across Europe facing all sorts of trials and tribulations. And he never reached a point where he said, well, what he has now done is enough. He continued spreading the gospel and sharing the name of Jesus, creating disciples for Jesus. In writing to those at Philippi, he said that he wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. In this section, Philippians 3, the heading in my Bible is pressing on toward the goal. Not that I have already obtained all this. He knows that he is to persevere in his journey of faith. Not that I have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. He is still journeying on. He is still going to persevere. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In this journey of faith, we need to be intentional. We need to look out for the markers and to ask to be shown the way. We need to be prepared for the ups and downs that we will meet along the way. And we need help. We cannot do this in our strength alone. And we need perseverance. We need to pray for the encouragement to persevere as we journey on this journey of faith. Amen. I want to pray to you the words from a song. It's one of the two songs that have been chosen. One is, To You, O Lord, and the second is, Guide me, O Thou Great Redeemer. This is a prayer based on Psalm 25. Let us pray. To You, O Lord, we lift up our souls. In you we trust, O you, our God. Do not let us be put to shame, nor let our enemies triumph over us. Show us your ways, teach us your paths, guide us in the truth and lead us on. For you are our God, you are our Saviour. Our hope is in you each moment of the day. No one whose hope is in you will be put to shame to shame. And that's why our eyes are on you, O Lord. Surround us, defend us. Oh, how we need you. To you, we lift up our souls. Remember, Lord, your mercy and love that ever flow from of old. Remember not the sins of our youth or our rebellious ways. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. 
That's why our eyes are on you, O Lord. Surround us, defend us. Oh, how we need you to lift up our souls, to lift up our souls. Amen. Please listen to the, the two songs that I've mentioned if you haven't already done so. And uh, I greet you and just wish you every blessing for the week that lies ahead. We close with the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with and abide with you now and forever. Amen. Show me your ways and teach me your paths. Guide me in truth, lead me on. For you're my God.